Welcome to the Probate Nation. My name is Richard Ruddy. As we have learned over the course of many shows, persons appointed as fiduciaries in an estate, testamentary trust, conservatorship, or for the property of a minor child, all have to be bonded. In some appointments, the bond might be without surety, essentially a personal bond. In other appointments, however, the bond must have surety, and this means an insurance company must be involved. In earlier shows, we discussed the process to apply for a corporate surety bond when you should apply, and what factors are considered by the insurance company in deciding whether or not to issue a surety bond to insure you. Over the course of our next two shows, we're going to examine how surety bonds are enforced against the insurance company providing the surety when there is a bond forfeiture. And then we will examine how the insurance company recovers its losses from the fiduciary. Our show this evening begins by taking a closer look at what is a surety bond and when it is required. Reviews of the surety bond application itself, and we will also discuss what an indemnity agreement is. And finally, we will begin an examination of the types of personal commitments the fiduciary makes when signing the indemnity agreement in order to get a surety bond. We are pleased to have as our guests tonight two attorneys who represent insurance companies issuing surety bonds. They will serve as our guides as we start a discussion on the enforcement of surety bonds. Our first guest is a partner in the national law firm of Watt, Teeter, Hoffer, and Fitzgerald in its McLean, Virginia office. Her practice focuses on creditor rights and bankruptcy, including probate surety bonds such as administrator, executor, conservator, and guardian bonds. She is a board member of the Maryland Bankruptcy Bar Association and an active member for the American Bankruptcy Institute, the Northern Virginia Bankruptcy Bar Association, the Walter Chandler Inns of Court, and the International Women's Insolvency and Restructuring Confederation. She has written and presented on various creditor rights, bankruptcy, and surety issues. Our second guest is also a partner with Watt Teeter, Hoffer, and Fitzgerald, located in its Boston office. Her practice focuses on surety, construction, and insurance coverage. Her surety practice has particular emphasis on commercial surety bonds, which includes all probate surety bonds. She's an active member in the American Bar Association's tort trial and insurance practice section and is a vice chair of its Fidelity and Surety Law Committee. She has written and presented on various surety issues and is the author of a chapter in the ABA FSLC book entitled Probate Bonds. Please welcome attorneys Marguerite Duvall and Sharkresha DiBartolo. Ladies, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank so, Sharkresha, let's begin with the, the basics and start from the beginning. That is, kind of give me a, tell me what is a surety bond? Uh, thank you, Richard. Well, a surety bond is um, basically a promise um, uh, that one, that the surety makes um, to be liable for the debt um, default or failure of another. Okay, so who are the parties to a surety bond to this promise? Um, well, a surety bond is interesting because it's a three-party agreement. So there is the surety, um, its principal, which in the probate context is either the administrator or conservator, um, and then the court. So it's a three-party agreement whereby the surety agrees to guarantee the performance of the principal, the administrator, or the conservator, um, to the third party obligee, which is the court. Okay. So, Marguerite, who are the, the principals, or I, I should say fiduciaries, who typically need to obtain a surety bond? Well, in the context of probate, um, we see uh, principals uh, along the lines of trustees for trusts appointed under a will, uh, conservators of let's say a minor child or some other similar type of conservatorship, uh, administrators of intestate estates or uh, testate estates or ex also known as or executors under a will. Uh, so we'll see those sort of um, principles oftentimes are re required to post a surety bond. So, so just so I, so what is the meaning of a surety bond? Is it is there some sort of guarantee involved here? Yes, essentially uh, the way the surety bond works is that by issuing the surety bond, the bond, the surety is guaranteeing the uh, faithful performance of the principal's um, 
duties to the estate, the trust, or the conservatorship. Uh, essentially, if the fiduciary doesn't perform those duties, then the surety will generally in the form of monetary compensation to the estate, trust, or conservatorship uh, pay in to those estates for the failure for those duties to be performed. So are there any, are there typically any conditions on the bond? This is one of the, is basically it's faithful discharge of the duties. We expect, or I say our clients expect that when they issue the bond, the principals will faithfully perform the duties uh, of the position that they're placed in. And that means filing inventories and accounting and properly dealing with assets of the estate, conservatorship, or the trust. And so uh, the conditions are the faithful discharge. And if those conditions aren't met, if our principal hasn't done what they're supposed to do, that's when we, when the bond might get triggered. So, Sharkreesh, let me turn to you. So is the bond really almost like an insurance policy? Uh, no, Richard, it's not. It's what Marguerite said. It's a guarantee and it's a promise. Um, it does provide um, some protection to heirs um, and creditors of the estate uh, because the surety would be in the position of potentially um, uh, reimbursing the estate if there has been um, some sort of failure to um, discharge the duties of the estate by the principal. But it's not an insurance policy. It's a guarantee and it's only secondarily liable and it's only liable if the principal is liable to the estate. So is any loss that the estate incurs covered by the surety bond? No, it's not. And that's really um, one of the ways that it does differ from an insurance policy. So the, the losses that are covered by the bond are only those where the principal fails to perform um, his or her trust. So the bond is really meant only to cover losses that relate to mismanagement or waste or fraud. Um, there's no liability of either the principal or the surety unless there's been a violation of um, the principal's duty of care to um, the heirs of the estate or to creditors or to, to a ward if you're talking about a conservatorship. Um, so if the estate incurs a loss but the principal exercised reasonable care in, in performing its duties towards the estate, then there's no liability either for the principal or the surety. So, so if an estate though has no money, does the surety bond, is the surety bond still liable to estate creditors? No, it's not. I'm assuming that there has been um, a faithful performance by um, the uh, by the administrator, and that there, you know, has been no issue with how they've handled the property. There would be no liability for the surety or the principal. And and so, that's I understand. Is there a limit as to the liability of the surety? Yes, in that way, it is kind of like an insurance policy. So what we call it the penal sum. So the penal sum of the bond is the limit, and that's set at the time that the bond is issued. And the surety's liable is never liability is never more than that penal sum. Okay. Well, Marguerite, let's turn to um, when are surety bonds required to kind of get a little more detail. And I want to express my appreciation to the Fairfax Probate Office and Jason Pardo, the manager there, for his help and kind of flushing out some of these details for us as we go through this area. So Marguerite, for an estate, when can a bond be without surety? So there's a couple instances where uh, for an estate, and, I'm, and when I talk about an estate, I think it's important to talk about, uh, in this instance, uh, an estate in general. Uh, a bond can be without a surety when the assets are less than $25,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see some very small estates out there and the risk essentially to the beneficiaries is very little. Um, there's just not a lot there. So that they're not going to require the extra expense of getting a bond. Uh, you'll also, um, an estate can also be without a bond when the fiduciary or the co-fiduciary is a bank or a trust company. Essentially, uh, I, there's some, you know, people think banks are good and trust companies are good in the sense that they're, they're going to fulfill their duties. Um, if they serve as fiduciaries or co-fiduciaries. And so there's a security in and of itself by nature of being that kind of entity. Uh, uh, a bond will also not be required if all the beneficiaries for the estate are also the fiduciaries for the estate. So that means if you have three daughters 
and their mother has passed away and they're the only three heirs to the estate and all three of the fiduciaries, then a bond may not be required in those circumstances. Um, likewise, uh, and that's if whether there's a will or there's not a will. And then if the will waives the bond. So oftentimes the wills will say bond is waived. And there, there are instances where sometimes people request that the bond be waived and there, all this is also subject to ultimately court review and approval. And sometimes the court can require a bond even when the will might have waived it because the assets of the estate are such or some another beneficiary has requested it. So there's always exceptions to the rules, but those are generally what a bond without a surety. So, so I, so I can, I, I don't want to uh, get too hung up on this area, but certainly if, if a testamentary trust is named in a will, my understanding is that um, a bond will be, a surety bond will be required unless it's specifically waived in the, tr in the trust agreement. And I know that uh, in the case of wrongful death lawsuits that people can qualify um, for the sole purpose of bringing the lawsuit and they only have to put up a hundred dollar cash bond. Um, so I, I think you've covered pretty extensively where the, where we have to get bonds. Let's talk about the surety bond application itself, Shakrisha. Um sure. I have, I have a form that we have, we've used in the office in the past, which I will not try to show on screen because you'd have to need a microscope to see it, but it's very small print. But the, the bond the application itself is actually two pages, and we're going to go through the first part of this first page, which really talks about the kind of information that's gathered. So, so let's talk. So this is generally, tell me, Sir Krisha, how is a surety bond obtained? Well, it's. Um, it's obtained much in the way that you obtain an insurance policy. You go through an agent. Um, there are certain agents that have that um, specialize um, in issuing bonds, including bonds for um, conservatorships or probate or for estates. Um, the clerk's office typically will have the names of those agents. So if you were looking to be appointed as an administrator of an estate, you could go to the clerk's office and they would give you that information. Um, then you contact the agent and they do exactly what you were just talking about, Richard. They go through a preliminary process, get some um, in initial information like a name, maybe some credit information, maybe just a little initial financial information. And then eventually you would fill out a much longer form, that form that you were talking about that asks for more information and then has some agreements that we're going to talk about it included um, along with the application. Okay. Now, I know, Marguerite, um, um, further down in the application form that I have, one of the things they, one of the key questions they ask is, is the attorney going to be involved and, uh, and will they remain involved? Tell me, is how important is that as far in the application process? Do, if well, you know. I, sorry. Um, I, it's a, we, I'll put it this way, we often see surety bond applications come across, or at least when I get involved, where there's no attorney involved at the beginning or at all through the process. So the bond certainly can be issued without having a surety, or sorry, an attorney involved. But the importance of the attorney is, you know, dealing with estates or trusts or conservatorships, it's, it's not straightforward. It's not natural for a lot of people. They don't know what they necessarily need to do. And so they'll want advice of an attorney to help them make sure they're meeting deadlines. There's certain things that require court, court approval before you can take those actions that can ultimately come back um, to, I say, haunt you if you don't get the court approval uh, before taking those actions, and that could impact the bond. And so the bonding company will want to know, do you have an attorney? Is someone going to be helping you with this? And and you know, if so, they're going to be involved along the way because that could help. Um, and we'll get into this later, but that can help uh, stop at the beginning potential issues from arising. Okay. Well, there's much more information that's collected in the in the page one of this particular application form, which I think is fairly typical. But let's jump ahead to page two, Shakrisha, and let's talk about the document that really is the enforcement tool that is used should a surety bond uh, be, be, be forfeited. Uh, and that's the indemnity agreement. So can you expl please explain for our audience, what is an indemnity agreement? Sure, Richard. Well, you know, as we talked about at the very beginning, um, the bond itself was a three-party agreement between the surety, the principal, and the obligee. Um, when a surety writes that bond, 
um, the underwriters expect that they are not going to incur loss, um, um, unlike an insurance policy, um, even though they've agreed to guarantee the performance of their principal, which means that they might ultimately have to pay some money to the estate. And the way that they um, uh, prevent a loss from happening is that the principal signs what's called an indemnity agreement as a part of the application process. And that indemnity agreement provides a number of things, but at bottom, um, what it does is it provides that the principal agrees to indemnify or pay back the surety for any loss, any loss that it might have um, as a result of having issued the bond. And, and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about um, some of those details. Sure, and I will say that, that the whole back page in small print, again, you need a magnifying glass to read it, um, has all of these different types of agreements that you as the fiduciary are, 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 um, are agreeing to, to be, a, be bound by. And Marguerite, in that regard, I, I, you know, one, of course, one of the big things at the very beginning, of course, is that you represent that all the information you give to the bonding in the bonding application on page one is true and correct. So you better make sure that you're accurate when you say something on the first page. But then the second page, one of the key provisions I want you to talk about, Marguerite, if you could, is, is can you explain the importance of the provision that says that the fiduciary will exonerate and indemnify the surety from all claims, losses, and so on and so forth, which is collectively called a loss. What are we trying to cover there? What we're trying to cover here is the full range of potential monetary expenditures by the surety as a result of issuing this bond. Uh, so in simple terms, for example, let's say our, our principal, our fiduciary, let's say the executor of an estate has not filed an accounting for many, many months or years and it looks like money might be missing. And even if money's not missing, we just don't know what's going on. And so what will happen is the, and we'll, we might address this a little bit later on in more detail, but what will happen is the surety will usually get notified by the court or the commissioner of accounts that something is awry, we get pulled in. And if the surety has to hire outside counsel, sometimes the courts require the surety to send a representative to court, then like someone like me or Shakrisha, then um, that costs the surety money. And so even if there's not a loss ultimately in the sense of the money wasn't stolen from the estate, but the surety still had to pay an attorney to show up and protect its interest in court, that can come back and be charged uh, back to the bond principal um, and the fiduciary of the estate to have to pay the surety company back. Well, that's, so the purpose so, is to be very broad and cover all those instances. So it's very important for, for fiduciaries to understand then that even though they haven't necessarily been charged with anything yet, if they don't respond to inquiries about why they haven't done something and bond counsel has to get involved, then bond counsel goes on the clock and that clock is something that they're going to have to pay for. So um, as we'll talk about later, it's really important to be responsive to notices, especially from the Commissioner of Account and the court. Um, Sharkrisha and, and, and Marguerite, I want to go ahead and turn, because I will come back and talk more about some of the provisions in the indemnity agreement in, in part two, because there's, there's a lot to cover there. But let's talk about some of the common problems and pitfalls. Now, you guys have been doing this for many, many years now. And based upon what you've seen so far in our show tonight and what you've learned over the years of your experience, what are some of the common problems and pitfalls that applicants can encounter? Oh, well, Richard, I would say that, you know, the one that's come up most often for me is that some of these applicants are inexperienced in handling financial matters and don't, um, they just, they may not even have had to balance their own checkbook, but then they're put in the position of, of having to manage someone else's money. And I think sometimes not having that experience can pose a problem in the application process. It also can pose a problem at the end of the day um, in, in just how the estate or the conservatorship is managed. So having um, some financial experience, I think, is helpful both from being able to get a bond as well as being able to manage some of these estates. Marguerite, how about yourself? What are your, what are your observations about some of the common problems you see applicants encounter once they've been bonded? I would echo uh, Shakrisha's comments, uh, but uh, I'll take a step further and say sometimes I see, you know, it, we, we want people who know 
the decedent to get, and I say this decedent or conservatorship, you want people who know the family to be involved in this process because who knows where all the skeletons are better than your own family members? <laughs> and, and who has the best interest? Generally, you would think family. And so even if you, I don't want to, you know, it's important to have a financial background, but that shouldn't scare people away. The first and for, foremost is to be communicative and organized and just track money in and money out and keep receipts. And that's where a lot of people get in trouble. And the other thing is to ask for help when you need it. And I, I say this because too often I have heard from a bond principal, it was my father. I just, I didn't have the emotional capacity to deal with his estate. I am still dealing two years later with his death. And that is perfectly fine. We get this. This is a very tough part of your life that you're going through. I. And that's understandable, but you also agreed to take on this role. And so if you need help, hire an attorney or come forward and say, listen, I am not capable of doing this. I'm just not emotionally there. I don't have the financial background. And, at, and more often than not, a commissioner, the bonding company, we can all come to an agreement to have someone else step in and take over with very, very little implication for you under the bond. And that's important just recognizing your own personal limitations and coming forward sooner rather than later. Because if you put it off, that's when the, it snowballs and it, things can become a bigger problem than what they could have been. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, Marguerite. I certainly, we've seen in our office um, and what we encourage folks, you know, is that, you, you know, you can, you can do the job. You don't need to be a special skill, but you have to be able to at least balance a checkbook and keep good records. And, and more importantly, I think, as you mentioned, don't be afraid to ask for advice. I mean, uh, that's why you have, you know, accountants and lawyers and CPAs, and they can, they can guide you to make sure you don't, you know, you know fall by the wayside of, as you try to do what you think is a good job. Well, we're, we're running out of time, so let's go to some closing comments. Can you share some final uh, thoughts and words of advice and practical suggestions uh, regarding our discussion tonight about the surety bond application process and what people should, should might, might want to consider doing as they uh, undertake this task of being a fiduciary. Uh, Shakrisha, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I would just say um, it, it looks like a lot on that application, but, you know, read the application and, um, you know, understand what you're getting into with respect to the obligations um, that, you know, you may owe to the, um, the surety and, you know, reaching out and, you know, either talking with an attorney or even the agent who is um, helping you um, apply for the bond, they can talk you through some of those provisions and help you to understand um, essentially what you're getting into. And I think that um, before you take on the task, it's good to at least know, you know, what those obligations are. Um, and, you know, reading the application is the first step towards that. Marguerite, how about yourself? I would um, say that be organized, <laughs> really into organization. Uh, just look at my, if I could show you my office right now, you'd see there's highlighters and matching post-its. We're not saying that that's what you need to do, but be organized, keep track of what you have and just recognize no one's going to blame you if you choose not to be the fiduciary of an estate if, you're, if you don't feel up for it after you've gone through the process. But once, you're there, once you've decided to do it, you need to communicate and be organized and keep track of where money goes, your assets goes, and your receipts. So if you spend a dollar or you have someone take some stuff to be donated, just get a receipt and keep that in a place that, you, you know, when it comes time, people can help you. And talk to, you know, talk to an attorney, um, you know, talk to the agent. And the Commission of Accounts offices throughout the Commonwealth are very helpful. I will say that they go above and beyond to try to help fiduciaries with compliance uh, and that there are resources there. And if you just start off strong, you with the right foot forward, then it won't, it's not a hard process once you figure out what that process is and you just stick to it. It's like setting a routine. You know, your alarm's gonna go off at 7 a.m. every morning. That's approach it in that kind of mindset. 
Well, I want to thank Marguerite and Shakrisha from the law firm of Watt, Teeter, Hoffer, and Fitzgerald for taking the time to visit the Probate Nation and share with our viewers through your extensive knowledge, advice, and experience on the enforcement of, insurety, of surety bonds. And what we learned tonight is a valuable information for all fiduciaries appointed to serve and a great public service to the Northern Virginia community. So I also want to express again my appreciation to Jason Pardo, manager of the Fairfax County Probate Office, and his team for their contribution to this program as well. You know, if you assume the responsibility as a, a court-appointed fiduciary and must be bonded with surety, please consider carefully the risk you have should you fail to perform as required under law. What I learned this evening is that the indemnity agreement essentially leaves no stone unturned in protecting the surety. We encourage fiduciaries, whether bonded with surety or not, to get advice early from a qualified attorney with experience in fiduciary matters. And please do not ignore a notice from the Commissioner of Accounts that you have not done some task. Legal advice and timely responses to notices will serve you well and keep you out of trouble. Please join us when we continue this discussion on enforcement of surety bonds in part two. This brings us to the conclusion of our show this evening. Hope it was informative and remember that replays of the show can be viewed on the Probate Nation website. On behalf of myself and the Probate Nation, thank you for visiting with us.